Hello, everyone. My name is Leon Bibb. On behalf of the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, I want to thank you really for joining us today. Rooted in the Jewish value of respect for all humanity, the Maltz Museum looks to the past so that we can understand the present and build a better future for all. But we don't have to look very far back in our American history to explore this topic on our program today. The state of hate is an ongoing crisis. I sit before you as the first black primetime news anchor in the state of Ohio. I have witnessed discrimination firsthand. I have also seen the good that can come from breaking down barriers and building bridges of understanding between people of all ages, faiths, cultures, and backgrounds. Thank you to the museum's many community partners supporting this program, from universities and colleges to media, arts and cultural organizations to social justice institutions and diversity and inclusion advocates. It takes all of us to build a better world and raise our voices together so we can be heard. This year marks the 150th anniversary of what's called the Ku Klux Klan Act, also known as the Civil Rights Act of 1871. Yet violent acts of racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia fill our news channels and media feeds with increasing alarm, begging this question, how has our country really changed in 150 years? To help us understand how hate groups like the KKK rise to power, what role they play in American culture today, and how the law is used to protect victims of hate. We're joined by guest speaker Avery Friedman, a premier civil rights attorney and CNN commentator. We're also fortunate to be joined by Marsha Fudge, the 18th Secretary of U.S. Housing and Urban Development. Secretary Fudge knows Ohio well. She was the U.S. Representative for the 11th Congressional District of Ohio. She was also the first female and first African-American mayor of Warrensville Heights, Ohio. After we hear from both of our special guests, I'll be back on the screen for a one-on-one -on -one interview with Avery Friedman. Secretary Fudge, the virtual stage is now yours. Thanks to the leadership of the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage for inviting me to this important conversation. I thank founders Milton and Tamar Maltz, Chair Dinner and Managing Director Schaefer. Thanks as well to Avery Friedman for sharing his insights on the vital need to expand equality and fairness in our nation. I am honored to work for an administration that is determined to further social and economic justice on behalf of marginalized communities. On his first day in office, President Joe Biden signed an executive order directing our government to explore solutions for advancing racial equity in America. Since then, his administration has centered our agenda around the guiding principles of equity by delivering relief to people and communities who have fallen behind as a result of the pandemic, by distributing vaccines for COVID-19, and by proposing dramatic investments to empower workers and families of color. At HUD, we are proud to do our part to support the president's vision. We know people of color still face discrimination in our housing market when trying to rent homes, to secure mortgages, and to move into neighborhoods with greater opportunities. That is why, as secretary, I will make enforcing our nation's fair housing laws a top priority. I know everyone joining this conversation shares the president's commitment to forge a more inclusive and more just America. HUD is proud to serve as your ally and your partner in realizing this mission. Thank you very much and have a wonderful event. Hi, I'm Avery Friedman. In 1999, the Ohio White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan decided they wanted to pay a visit to Cleveland. It must have been a coincidence because there was a major black expo taking place in downtown Cleveland. And we knew there was going to be trouble. I was hired by the Cleveland police in a highly visible battle, cops versus the Klan. Here's how the case played out when they claimed they were coming for a peaceful protest. I spotted a shotgun by one of the Grand Dragon's lieutenants. Take a look at this. You don't see me with a shotgun. I don't need a shotgun. You got a now. shotgun right behind you, don't you? Absolutely. Uh, there might be somebody behind me having one to protect me from stupid <laughs> yeah. idiots like you. Yeah, right. There have always been hate groups ready to intimidate Americans, and actually much worse. In this kind of case, such as 
when the Klan gets involved, a group seeks to pick on people, and it doesn't matter how innocent they are, men, women, and even children. Because let's say they came from a different country, or maybe they're a different color, or maybe they practice a faith that the hate group doesn't care for. Well, here in America, in a country we love, domestic terrorism has sadly been a part of our history. But as a decent and righteous nation, sometimes it takes us a little bit longer to get there. But terrorism against our own people was something that needed to be addressed. I got appointed by our late Chief Judge Frank Battisti, a wonderful judge, to be part of the remedy in a precedent-setting case called United States of America versus the City of Parma. It was a case that involved, from beginning to end, 28 years of my life. And it involved a proposed high-rise for the elderly. Well, politicians love buildings like that because that's where they put their mothers. Problem was that federal policy required that the building be marketed to the group least likely to apply. Well, you know what that meant. Once the Parma officials figured out what it did mean, the president of the Parma City Council told the media, quote, we don't want Negroes in Parma. Well, for me, after nearly 3,000 federal cases over four decades, pretty rare that politicians say that sort of thing out loud. And for me, the most complicated part of the case is what do you call people from Parma? Parmites? Parmanians? Parmesans? The effort to minimize racial terrorism and domestic terrorism came about because of activities that occurred well over 150 years ago. And the people putting up nasty billboards or nasty threats came out of Klan rallies literally all over the country. You see, the Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1865 at the end of the Civil War, and its growth into the latter part of that decade and into the 1870s created an interest by Congress to do something about racial terrorism. White Confederate generals, instead of being tried for treason, were for the most part set free, but they never relinquished their beliefs that slavery and the lifestyle it created for white Americans in the South was something that they believed in. The Klan played the lead in Southern resistance to American Reconstruction between 1865 and 1870. So they set up their own society, advocating what I always felt were treasonous principles antithetical to American principles. It employed violence, murder, arson, intimidation, and other hate-motivated activities. It was domestic terrorism arising out of the liberation of Americans who were former slaves. So after the murder of President Lincoln, Congress finally took up a series of actions to outlaw American domestic terrorism. Within several years after the Confederacy's defeat, the Klan operated what it called a, quote, invisible empire of the South. Leading Confederate General Nathaniel Bedford Forrest was chosen as their leader, or the Grand Wizard. It's not noteworthy that as of right now, his berry is being disinterred and moved to a Confederate memorial a museum 200 miles away. And can you imagine? America has a Confederate memorial museum. After four or five years of murder and mayhem, action by the United States against the enemy was already overdue. And Congress passed a law, a federal law, that sought to do something about it. You see, it was 150 years ago that Congress passed its first anti-terrorism law, the Civil Rights Act of 1871, otherwise known as the Ku Klux Klan Act. 
This was to stop terrorism against those liberated Americans who were former slaves. And the Ku Klux Klan Act set the tone for other federal laws that sought to stop groups from terrorizing Americans for the exercise of their rights. The Ku Klux Klan Act created a new civil remedy when a citizen of the United States suffered an invasion, that's the language of the Supreme Court, of a constitution or federal right. It's a federal statute reaffirmed time and time again by the Supreme Court to, quote, provide for equal rights, end quote. The act provides a civil remedy for damages when the rights of Americans are deprived. And listen to this. That included a section that made it unlawful for any person to conspire to intimidate, to deprive someone of equal protection under the laws, including the right to vote. You know, we heard Secretary Fudd share with us a commitment to equal opportunity in housing. That's a federally protected right. It involves equal rights. If two or more individuals seek to deny a citizen those rights, it can violate the Ku Klux Klan Act. You see, this law bars both public and private intimidation. The Ku Klux Klan Act is the vehicle. If you find a federally protected right, then the KKK Act is an independent vehicle that gets it into a federal courtroom. That's what I get to do. Next. You, you have the vehicle, you need the right. And it comes from a federal law or derives from the Constitution. Here's an example. After 9-11, a young man at a public high school in Northeast Ohio put up a poster on his high school locker. And it supported American policy against terrorism. It was a patriotic poster. Well, the adults at that high school, the superintendent, and principal thought that the poster interfered with the educational process and didn't suspend him, they expelled the 16-year-old. Using the Ku Klux Klan Act, we found a vehicle to get into federal court to say the First Amendment protects patriotic speech, just like it protects nasty speech. Well, the federal judge ultimately approved putting this young man back into school by using this Klan Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, and in addition, listen to this, sent the superintendent and the president back to school to learn about the American Constitution. Wow. So it tells you how powerful this law is when local officials get in the way of individual rights and also those rights that Secretary Fudge talked about earlier today. There's a federal law that prohibits housing bias. The Supreme Court called that a badge, an incident of slavery. In other words, taking away an American's right to live where they can afford free from restrictions of race is a badge, an incident of slavery. Every law in America has to have a constitutional foundation. And the law that we're talking about here has as its constitutional foundation the 13th Amendment. Well, what is that? The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. And here we are in the roaring 20s of the 21st century, and we still, unfortunately, have to talk about the vestiges of slavery. Well, that law involves more than the right to get a home. It, in, it also covers insurance practices like appraisals. It includes banking practices like redlining. It involves uh, practices such as barring group homes or young families with children. That is a federal right. And the Ku Klux Klan Act is an independent way of getting into a federal courtroom, especially if there's a conspiracy to block equal opportunity. How did that law come about? It's hard to believe that America's greatest civil rights lawyer, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 
was murdered 53 years ago. It's also hard to believe that Dr. King has been dead longer than he was alive. You see, when Dr. King was murdered, he was only 39 years old. And here's what he said one day before he was assassinated, quote, morality can't be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can restrain the heartless. There's only one reason that federal law comes into existence, and that was as a direct consequence of the murder of Dr. King on the 4th of April, 1968. And as a result of the riots that were triggered all around America, legislation guaranteeing equality rocketed through both houses of Congress and was hand carried and signed by Lyndon Johnson, the president, on the 11th of April, one week after the murder. There's no law in American history that has that kind of dramatic and provocative background. And now, Americans who get pushed around because of what color they are or where they're from can stand up and fight back. These are the kind of anti-intimidation laws that can be, can be used when Americans get pushed around. Now, you wouldn't know who Leonard William Armstrong is. Well, he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and he has a very special title. He was chosen the Grand Dragon of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan in Tennessee. Not an aspiring dragon or a dragon emeritus, he's the Grand Dragon. Well, Grand Dragon Armstrong had a juvenile protege named Damian Patton, referred to by our federal appeals court as a skinhead. They apparently didn't much care for Jewish people who lived in the Nashville area. Adults, babies, didn't matter to them. So they had no use for people like that. And as far as Grand, Grand Dragon Armstrong and Mr. Patton were concerned, one way to teach them about the consequences of practicing their faith, they figured, was to go over to the West End Synagogue in Nashville and shoot it up. So they went over there, shot up the synagogue with AK-47s. The bad news was that the synagogue was pretty shot up. But the good news is that there was nobody there. And the criminal prosecution using the civil rights laws were utilized to secure convictions of these people. And remember, there has to be a federally protected right. And you know what the court found? Remember that badge and incident of slavery language we talked about? the vestiges of slavery? Well, the court concluded that those people who would have attended that synagogue suffered the loss of post-slavery activity, the badges and incidents of slavery. How does the law work today? Well, a couple of years ago, an intriguing opinion was written by U.S. District Court Judge Norman Moon. That's a name you probably don't know, but you're going to know it because he was the sitting federal judge in Charlottesville, Virginia. I have to tell you, I love federal judges. I love them not just here in San Francisco or Cleveland or anywhere else, but all over the country. They're ordinarily the best of the best. And Judge Moon pretty much typified that when he saw what happened at the race riot in Charlottesville. Listen how the federal judge starts his opinion, and he does it in five or six short sentences. Quote, in 1871, Congress passed a law directed at organized terrorism in the Reconstruction South. Over 140 years later, on August 11th and 12th, the defendants in this lawsuit including the Ku Klux Klan, various neo-Nazi organizations, and associated white supremacists held rallies in Charlottesville. Violence erupted. Charlottesville residents who suffered injuries at the rallies, the plaintiffs, alleged 
that this violence was no accident. Instead, they alleged, writes Judge Moon, the defendants violated the 1871 Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, and state laws that prohibit conspiring to engage in violence against racial minorities and others. The defendants retorted, saying, it's our First Amendment right to attend a rally. But the judge wrote, is while the ultimate resolution of what happens in the rallies awaits another day, the court held that the plaintiffs, the victims of Unite the Right, had the right to proceed under the Ku Klux Klan Act. And you know what the law was? Badges and incidents of slavery. That phrase that came about through the Supreme Court's decision in recognizing that federal right. I was the only Yankee who served as counsel for the Texas Commission on Human Rights in a battle against the Texas realm of the white chameleonites of the Ku Klux Klan. The grand dragon there, Charles Lee, he's the guy in the picture with the pointy hat, was the leader of the organization, and a murder occurred in Viter, Texas. That was along the southeast border of the Texas-Louisiana line on State Route 10. The experience in going up the eastern border of Texas in cities like Tyler and Marshall and Nacogdoches and Texarkana taught me about sundown cities. If you were black and you didn't leave by sundown, you weren't going to be waking up the next morning. And the murder that arose out of that was why the Texas Commission got involved against the Klan. To give you an idea of how complicated and serious and provocative and divided things are. This is how the Klan recruits for young members down on the Texas-Louisiana border. Pretty serious stuff. I want to thank you for being with me today. Wish we were in person and I could see your faces. The Ku Klux Klan Act is a powerful anti-intimidation federal statute that protects Americans against violence and protects the rights ensured to all of us under the Constitution of the United States. It's often been invoked because of violent propensities of hate organizations, which subscribe to of hate organizations which subscribe to supremacist mentality today in something that should have ended yesterday. They resent the truly American principles of equality. And when you hear them say, and it's not just Klansmen, it is amazing how people characterize Americans who are black. Before I leave, let me ask you this. Haven't you heard someone say this before? What do these people want? What do these people want? I have to tell you, sometimes I swear I feel like I am to the bigot what the moon is to a werewolf. But you know, after thousands of federal prosecutions, I've learned that when they say, what do these people want? It is not a positive thing. It's an ugly thing, and it happens more than you could imagine. What do these people want? Interestingly enough, that question was answered nearly 100 years ago by a young man from Cleveland who attended Central High School. His name, the legendary poet and writer Langston Hughes. What do these people want? Here's what he said. Black Americans want what so proudly we hail in the twilight's last gleaming. We want my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. We want everything we ever heard about in all the Fourth of July speeches ever made. For the Maltz Museum, I'm Avery Friedman. I've got a question for you, Avery, because uh, you really were, were very, very, very good in your in your presentation. But let's go a little bit deeper in what you think some of the some of the things you just said. Uh, you said the 1871 law is the vehicle used to protect people 
and their rights to free speech and freedom to assemble and all, and all, all of that. Uh, talk a little bit about how that 1871 law gives us that right and that protection. Well, the interesting thing is after the Civil War, a series of civil rights laws were enacted and the Constitution was amended to ensure that people who under the law were considered property became citizens, human beings. And so the fiction that the nation was based on, that black people were not human, uh, changed radically. And so Congress realized we needed radical laws to adapt to that very important critical change. Um, So the right to contract, the right to own property, were rights passed by Congress, but it needed to create the vehicle to find a way to get into a federal court to enforce these newly created rights. And that's exactly what the 1871 law did. It was the the avenue to get to the destination. If someone has turned you away because of race, or you can't buy a home, or you can't even enter into a contract, the 1871 law, at least when it relates to government interference and, and conspiracies, gets you into that courtroom so you can enforce those rights. You know, Avery, you, you often have talked about the vestiges of slavery. Uh, some people may be wondering, what are the vestiges of slavery? How does slavery still have its impact on our lives in the, in the 21st century? Well, the Supreme Court answered that question, Leon. And, and, and what the court said was that when an American, who happens to be black, is turned away from a deal to enter into a contract or buy a home, that is, according to the Supreme Court, a badge, an incident of slavery. That is, a vestige of slavery. And so the question is, what are the vestiges that exist today? Well, believe it or not, and you've seen it, I've seen it, most Americans have seen it, people are treated differently on account of race. And especially when the government does it, a police department, uh, uh, an agency, denies someone equal opportunity. That's a vestige of slavery. And that's what the 1871 law does. It gets you into a courtroom so you can combat those vestiges and live a, a full citizenship. That's the, that's the intent of this law. Yeah. In 1871, um, Congress sought to outlaw racial terrorism, and the judge concluded that the people were victimized, both black and white. How were whites victimized in this, in the judge's eyes back in 1871? Well, I don't know that the judges thought about that in 1871, but through the series of interpretations of this law, it took almost a century for the Supreme Court to recognize that, you know what? After the Civil War, the Congress meant business. So the vestiges of slavery that we saw in the 20th century and we now see today, and and I have to tell you something, and, and I feel very strongly about this, and I think most Americans do. I testified before House subcommittees and Senate subcommittees. That was sacrosanct to me. Then on the 6th of January, I saw somebody marching through the very halls where I took that oath, carrying a Confederate flag. Now, if you're searching for for a vestige, and you may not understand what that is, when you see some thug busting up the citadel, the central nerve system of our democracy, and uh, parading with a with a Confederate flag, remember they were the enemies. Mm-hmm. They're the they're the ones who engaged in treason against the United States of America. Vestiges of slavery couldn't have been clearer, and we saw it on the sixth of January, twenty twenty one. Avery, I, I want to take you back uh, to, to Cleveland, 1999, when the Cleveland Police Union uh, contacted you uh, because there was going to be a Klan rally in, in Cleveland. 
and uh, uh, and you were involved with the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association. Tell us about that involvement and why they contacted you to represent them. It's one of those vestiges of slavery issues again. What was going to happen was the Klan wasn't coming into town for a peaceful protest. They were looking for trouble. And my guys knew that these were all convicted felons coming into our town looking for trouble. Um, when I spotted one of the lieutenants of the uh, Grand Dragon of Ohio standing there with a shotgun when they're suggesting that they're here for peaceful purposes, Leon, you know they weren't. Uh, in fact, a couple of my uh, police officer clients in that said, look for... Um, baseball bats and such stuck in shrubberies so because that was the same weekend a black expo was going on in town um, and because we were ready and because we were prepared the Klan didn't get away with anything they were stuck on a platform they couldn't do anything and ultimately Cleveland Cleveland prevailed in that case didn't the city want 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 the Klan to to be able to disrobe, robe and disrobe inside police headquarters or something like that? If I yeah, that, that, that was one of the freak, that was one of the freak out issues. Um, you have a core of law enforcement who are there to protect the people. And the Klan was going to dress in their, you know, pointy hats and robes uh, at the police station. It was an outrage and it was a symbol that Frankly, they couldn't deal with. And, and frankly, in that case, I was so honored to serve in the case of cops versus the Klan. And the best measure of that success is not there wasn't a window broken. There wasn't anyone hurt. We were ready to go and we prevailed over the Klan. Yeah. Let's talk a, a, a little bit about uh, Charlottesville. Uh, uh, just a couple of years ago here in this country, a federal judge in Charlottesville issued an order using the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act. Uh, tell me about that. You, you know all about that. Well, I do. And, and the fascinating thing about it is, you know, I've had students who've said, 1871, what do we care? Well, when the race riot took place, the white race riot in uh, Charlottesville, um, there were a lot of people countering the Klan that stood up to them. And they got beat up pretty much, both black and white people against the Klan. So the question presented to the federal district judge was, does the 1871 law, which prohibits conspiracies and picking on people because of what color they are, no matter who's participating, black and white, are they protected? Well, in a relatively recent ruling, the federal judge said, yes, this case is going to trial, and for those black and white Americans who got beat up by Unite the Right, they have a right to proceed against them and the institutional groups that were part of that. So exciting development, that case is going to trial this year. Avery, in, in uh, 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was, was assassinated in April of 1968. Uh, you do a lot with fair housing. You are the expert I go to when we want to talk about the Fair Housing Act. As I understand it, that fair housing piece of legislation was dead in the water in Congress, couldn't get out of committee, but then Dr. King was assassinated and something happened with that piece of legislation. Tell us that story. On the 4th of April, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. Within 24 hours, the nation was set on fire. Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. And members of Congress were saying, what do we do? Well, the answer was exactly what you mentioned legislation guaranteeing equal opportunity, bottled up in committee, rocketed through both houses of Congress, was hand carried and signed by Lyndon Johnson on the 11th of April, one week after the murder. There's no law, Leon, in American history that has that dramatic and provocative background. And you know what? Here we are in the 21st century, and we're still having to battle these vestiges of slavery 
people denying a home because of what color they are or where they're from. So the battle continues to rage, and that vehicle getting victims of discrimination and retaliation into federal courtrooms is the Ku Klux Klan Act. Which raises this question, Avery. Are you generally optimistic or pessimistic about where this nation is going as we stand here in 2021? Well, you know, there's always been bad guys and good guys uh, from the Boston Tea Party all the way to January 6th. Um, I've always believed that America is a just and righteous nation with good people and you have fringe elements. And when those fringe elements start getting in the way of your citizenship, the law isn't self-executing, Leon. Mm -hmm. Unless you stand up and fight back, the bad guys get away with it. So I guess to answer the question, I've always been optimistic. There were bumps along the way over the last couple of years. But now I see the Department of Justice coming around and making civil rights a priority. Uh, And so I now have my sisters and brothers in the government at the Department of Justice standing side by side in these federal court battles. And I don't know that I've ever felt more optimistic than right now. Well, I feel optimistic. If you're optimistic, I'm optimistic. (laughs) Well, Avery Friedman, civil rights attorney, give us a final thought. We're rounding third. We're heading home. Give us a final thought on, on everything that we've been talking about. Sum it up for us. Well, you know, we're going one-on-one, and I think I'm stating this correctly, but you're the only broadcast journalist in American history that went one-on-one with the assassin of Dr. King. And you took that example and evolved as a brilliant, premier broadcast journalist. So you are telling the truth to America. I'm enforcing the Constitution for America. So I want to stand shoulder to shoulder to, with people like you who stand up and fight back by using the truth. And those are standards that we both employ in our respective professions. Well, you're very kind. Many thanks. Avery Friedman, civil rights attorney extraordinaire and good friend. Thank you for your expertise and certainly your opinions. They are well worth listening to. Pleasure to be with you.